All right. Well, on today's episode, we are going to finish our brief discussion on the rapture of the church. Uh, we started to uh, we started that discussion last time um, by looking at First Thessalonians chapter four. The whole text um, is verses uh, thirteen through eighteen of First Thessalonians chapter four, and we looked at verses thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. And we're going to finish up the passage this time to give us a, a, a greater understanding of you know again from. Uh, from my perspective, from an amillennial perspective, what you know, what what I see as as far as it relates to understanding the rapture, because again, having finished the book of Revelation and also you know uh, denying that the rapture is in chapter three, verse uh, ten, and uh, chapter four, verses one and two. You know, the question is, OK, well, what about the rapture? OK, what do you have a belief in the rapture? Um, and if so, how, how do you see it being explained in Scripture? Um, that's what we're that's what we're in the middle of right now. And again, it's in the main text that a lot of people go to as it relates to the rapture. I do believe in the rapture, but it's just a different understanding of the rapture than most people hold. OK, um, and again, I, I want to be careful here. I'm not I, I'm not on an island by myself. I, I, it's not like I have my own understanding and I'm just the only one ever in human history or even presently right now who holds this. That's that's not the case. So I don't want to give that impression. But um, hopefully this will give you some answers as far as where, where I stand on the rapture issue. And hopefully you can see that even with that understanding, it's not doing violence to anything related to the gospel um, or, you know, or, or salvation or anything like that. And, and that's the thing we have to keep in mind because a lot of people treat it like that. A lot of, there are a lot of people that don't, and, and I appreciate that, but there are some people that do. Um, uh, and so we need to, and to be quite honest, I think that, I think that the results of what we see related to the rapture has a better ending uh, you know, um, than than what people, for example, the dispensational premillennial understanding would be. Um, you know, now that's that's not the reason why I hold the view that I do. I, it's just that, you know, when you compare the two sides, you know, um, I, I think that you know you come up on the better end of the uh, better end of things here, um, just as far as understanding how how all of this uh, this works from an all mill perspective. So we're gonna hopefully we'll we'll. You know, you'll answer any other questions that you might have in addition to any questions that you might have had. Hopefully some of those questions will have been answered in the last episode and will continue to be answered this go around. So that's the agenda for this episode. Some good things in store. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Yeah, so um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let me go ahead and start out again by reading the entire passage. I think that's what we did before. We looked at the, we, I read the entire passage and then we looked at the first few verses of it. Um, let's read the entire passage again, um, do a little bit of a, a review of some of the key points that we covered before uh, in the last episode and then proceed uh, with verses 16, 17, and 18 um, of this passage. Okay, so again, our text is um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is verses 13 through 18, and this is what it says. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not be grieved as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, it, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the, trum- with the sound of the trumpet, uh, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay, so that's the entire passage. And again, 
Last time we looked at verses 13 through 15. And by the way, let me just remind you, I think I said this like at the very end of last episode, um, and this will be a good, you know, just kind of transition into the shameless plug is that what we what we're going through now in in first Thessalonians four, I do make mention of first Thessalonians um, here and there, but we, we, you know, it's not as much of a deep dive as we've done as we did last time and what we're going to do now, um, although there are some things that are going to be repeated um, here that is that is in the book. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, you know, I, I hope that you all will will uh, will order a copy of my book. And so here's a shameless plug uh, for my book, Signs of the End. What did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? Now, the whole thing with the rapture, I, I the thing with the rapture, because again, the book is about Jesus' words to his disciples in the Olivet Discourse, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21. And one of the questions that I pose, and I believe it's on it's on the back of the book of you know some of the things that are going to be explored, is that does Jesus have anything to say about the rapture? And I say that that he does. Um, we don't think about it very much, but you know, and I'll and I'll give you a little bit of a taste of that today. I'm, I'm hesitant. I don't want to give too much away, but I want to give a, enough of a satisfactory answer that you leave this time satisfied, but still have some things to gain um, from the book if you should decide to to order the book. You should order the book. Um, you know, it it I, I believe that it'll be very that it'll be very helpful and profitable um for you. So um so there it is. Uh, Amazon.com and Barnesandnoble.com are the are the two main places that you can uh that you can uh place an order uh for that book. Now remember just a couple of big things that I want you to remember that we looked at last time. And one of those is that is that we need to remember, you know, just the issue at hand of what we're dealing with here. You know, we look at 1 Thessalonians 4, this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, and we look at it as a rapture passage. And in a certain sense, you can, because it does talk about the catching up of the of the saints, um, you know, to be with the Lord. Um, but let's understand here that, the, that what uh, Paul is trying to hit at here is actually the resurrection of the dead or glorification if we want to use another theological theological term here because the the concern of the Thessalonian church you know the question that they had was okay when Jesus comes back what is going to become of our 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 loved ones our family our loved ones and and people who have already died who have died before the second coming of Christ do they lose out on resurrection life, you know, in the, it, 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 I guess you should say in the eternal state, in the new heavens and the new earth, glorification and everything like that. That was their concern. And so that's why Paul would say in verse 13 that he doesn't want them to be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep. Because again, they are the subject of the of concern. What happens with them? Do they miss out on things when Jesus Christ comes back? Um, because if if they do, then that would create, you know, at least for those who are alive in Thessalonica, uh, a certain sense of grief because you know they, you know, their their loved ones won't won't be able to participate in the eternal state. Um, and if Christ comes back, which you know in the first century you could tell there was an expectation uh, that it could happen in their lifetime, um, and they were around to see that, then they wouldn't see their loved ones again. And so, like, if somebody dies. Uh, with that, with that mindset, if if someone that that they love, a family member, or a friend, or something dies, then that really that really makes the grief even harder to you know uh, to handle. And so that's why Paul says, you know, the reason why he doesn't want them to be uninformed about this, it says that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And he's about to inject them with some hope just as it, you know, just by explaining to them how this whole thing is going to work specifically. Now he's going to talk about those who are, uh, who have fallen asleep in the Lord, those who are dead and those who are alive when Christ comes back. But specifically he's going, he, he zeroes in on the whole thing of what's going to happen with those who are dead in the Lord. Okay. When, when Jesus Christ comes back. Okay, so I think so again, if we can if we can really just set our, our our focus on the eternal state, eternity, glorification, that's really that's really where a lot of the focus was was aimed at for a lot of a lot of people, I would say for Paul and the other apostles, and even for the hope that people had in the first century. 
Um, you know, and so, and even, even when you look, I don't think I mentioned this last time, but even when you look in places in the book of Acts, later in the book of Acts, I, I want to say, um, chapter, chapters, uh, 25 or 26 around there when Paul is before the councils and, you know, before Festus and everything like that, he, Paul talks about his hope in the resurrection as many people in Israel did. Um, the Sadducees didn't, uh, so much, but other, but everybody else did. And, and so that leads me again to remind you again of another important thing that we're dealing with here. And that is one resurrection, not a series of resurrections, because again, from the dispensational premillennial understanding of things, there's a series of resurrections, um, you know, that'll start before the tribulation and then after the tribulation and after the thousand years and that sort of thing. And I showed you this last time by showing you a few uh, uh, verses there where in the New Testament where, where it's mentioned, and even Jesus would also, mentions the resurrection in singular terms as an actual event. One event that happens that everybody's looking forward to, not one in a series of other you know, things that are, that are spaced out. Uh, by several years. And again, that's important to understand. And I think that that singular resurrection um, is is seen in conjunction with the singular understanding of coming. Because remember in verse 15, it says, for this we declare to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, okay, will not, pre- will not precede those who have, who have fallen asleep. Okay. And, and again, I, I think it's important to 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 lay out the truth that we were talking about a coming, we're talking about one coming. Because again, as I said before, the other side will uh, will essentially make a case for two comings. There's one at the rapture, and they'll look at this here as you know describing that one coming, and then the, uh, another coming of the Lord seven years later, after the tribulation, which is the actual second coming of Christ. Um, you know when he when he comes fully down to earth, and and the and the thing that I was saying is that just as there is one resurrection, there is one coming. So the resurrection and the coming of Christ are simultaneous. They refer to the same event. And so what we see here is we have a singular uh, resurrection, you know, just based on, you know, the other testimony of Scripture. We have one coming, which involves Jesus Christ descending. We see that here in verse 16, what we just read a few minutes ago, Okay. And that's what Jesus said he was going to do. He's going to descend from heaven, right? And um, and so with that, you know, there's that resurrection. Now, along with that, and Paul's going to explain that, that those who are alive, after those who have been, are dead in the Lord, after they are risen from their graves, then those who are left and who are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And, the, and so there's your rapture. But the way that I described it here, if you remember from last time, and if you don't, that's fine. Just go back and listen to the to the last episode, and as a reminder, or if you didn't listen to it uh, at first, uh, it, you know, at, at all, go ahead, go ahead and, and listen to that episode. Um, but you know, basically, you know, what we're dealing with here is an event. The event that we're dealing with here is the resurrection, and the rapture is just a feature within that one event of the resurrection. Okay. And I make that distinction because a lot of people will treat the rapture as the main, the next main eschatological event on the calendar. And technically that's not false, but again, depending on how you view or what perspective you view the rapture in, a lot of those people will say, okay, the next event is the rapture, which involves Christians who are alive now and, you know, people who were raised from the grave, they're, they're taken up and they, and they're taken up to be with the Lord in heaven. My case that I make, um, is that the rapture is, it is a catching up, um, and to meet the Lord in the air, but it's not to go up to heaven, but it's to meet the Lord in the air and then to, and then to bring him down, not bring him down. We don't bring him down. He comes on his own, but it's it's sort of as a participation in his coming in the sense that we escort him down to earth as he takes over in final uh dominion um you know and where he where he comes and he judges sin and sinners um and then we we you know once you know once ever, once that's all said and done we enter into the eternal state in a new heavens and a new earth 
And remember, I told you that the picture that we that we have of that is, you know, how kings or even uh, victorious military generals, when they were on their way to a city, how you had people from that particular city that would go out and they would meet that king or they'd meet that general out, in, you know, in the roadway and then escort him back in victory back to their city. So they leave, they leave the, they leave the city to meet, you know, their ruler, they, or to meet their king or to meet their general. And then they bring him, they bring him back, you know, all the, the, you know, the rest of the way back into the city. And so really that's something, if we look at it along those lines, I think that that's something that the ancients would have been very familiar with, um, you know, related to all of this, you know, and they would have understood the picture of that, of what will actually happen uh, with, at the rapture. They would see it as, you know, in the same vein as what happens on earth when people go out and greet their king or they greet their victorious general. Okay. And I believe that that's what you have there. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a going up into heaven, but it's going to meet the Lord in the air. And then we come back down with him, um, you know, the rest of the way, you know, and, and again, I, I think just a couple of minutes ago, the, the, the term that I use is that's, and, you know, as a way of, uh, you know, sharing the participation of that one event of bringing, of, of him coming down and, you know, judging sin and sinners and, and bringing it forth a new heavens and a new earth. Okay. So again, hopefully with that explanation, you see how with the rapture, the rapture is just a feature within the main event that, let's be honest, I think a lot of the first century people had their eye on, which was the resurrection. And I wish, I really do wish, this is this is a true genuine wish of mine. I, I really do wish that the resurrection um, is something that would that would get more attention nowadays. Not saying that nobody gives attention to the resurrection. You do have people talking about the resurrection and that and that sort of thing. But again, a lot of uh, for a lot of people, their eye is on the rapture. And again, that's because of you know how they how they view the rapture and what they view the rapture to be. Coming from my perspective, you know, I think and don't get me wrong, I think it's, I think it's going to be totally cool. To be to be caught up and to meet the Lord in the air. That's going to I'm, you know I don't want to shrug that off as non significant. But again, the greater weight I think of things in this whole thing is not and I guess you should say not only the resurrection, uh, but the actual second coming of Christ because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the second coming of Christ where everything in this world as it is right now will be told will be done away with and things will be made right and we will enter into the eternal state and the new heavens and the new earth. OK, that's what we're that's what we're looking forward to. So as we continue in our text here, um, you know, it says that um, again, remember that it says in uh, in verse 15, it says, for this, we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. And again, I want you to emphasize that term in your mind, coming of the Lord. This is no different than any other thing that you see in the Bible related to the coming of Christ. It's talking about the coming of Christ, his physical, bodily return to earth, you know, in its final sense, not a, a first stage of a coming that happens before a tribulation and then another one that will happen seven years later. This is the coming of the Lord. Uh, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of, of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So again, the with the with the emphasis again on those who have fallen asleep and what will become of them, not only are the are the Thessalonians comforted will they would they be comforted by Paul's words and saying that they're not going to miss out on anything. It's almost as if he's saying not only that, but listen, all the benefits that they start to receive will they will precede you in that. Okay. So it's not like they're going to be, you know, an afterthought when this whole thing is going down. No, he says they're actually going to be first, you know, because they're going to be raised and and everything like that. They're not going to precede those uh, um, who, I mean, those who are on earth will not precede those who are dead uh, when the Lord come, when the Lord comes back. One other one other quick thing that I want to remind you of that I think is very important because. Um, uh, it, it, I'm going to back up here in verse 14. Remember, it says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, uh, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And I, and I say the bring with him because again, 
for a lot of people who make the distinction between the rapture and the second coming, they'll say that the rapture is com- is Jesus coming for his saints, in other words, to take them up in heaven, and then the second coming is, is Christ coming with his saints. But as we pointed out last time, he's coming with his saints right here. You know, it says he will bring with, God will bring with him, with him, will bring with him. I mean, so I don't, I don't think you can get more clear than that. So if we're looking at this as a rapture passage, we have to come to terms with the fact that right here, scripture says that he brings with him those who have fallen asleep. So I think the way that I put it last time was, you know, how do we understand this? Is this Christ coming for his saints or with his saints? And the answer is yes. In other words, both, both. Okay. And so that's what we're dealing with. Now, as we get, as we, as we get into new territory here, starting in ver, in verse 16, we come up on something that's very important here, because one of the things that I want you to understand here and what I want you to notice and what I think is obvious from the text, okay, is that when this event happens, we're dealing with something that is very, very, very noticeable. It's something that's audible. I think that everybody's going to hear. And as we're going to see, and we're just going to appear, compare in, in another portion of scripture, it's something that, that people are going to see as well. Um, and so when you look at verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with, a, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, so just again, just to remind you that last part there of verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. So it's not over for them. They're not going to miss out on anything. When Christ comes back, they're going to be raised up. So that's good news, right? So whatever concern that the Thessalonian church had at that time, as far as what would become of their dead loved ones, Paul says the, the dead in Christ are going to, the, those who are dead in Christ will, will, will arise first. Okay, that's what you have going on here now. Here's the thing that I want you to understand, and I guess to to give you a greater understanding of what we're dealing with here and, and the fact that we're dealing with one event here and one coming of Christ, you have to understand that for many, 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 many people, um, I, I, dare, I, dare, I might dare to say most people in the dispensational premillennial camp, when it comes to their understanding of the rapture, and again, if, you know, I guess, especially if you're talking about a pre-trib rapture. Um, the way that it's been depicted for so many years and the way that it's been believed for so many years is that when the rapture happens, it's going to be a split second thing, just like that, you know, just like, you know, just kind of, and, and the, and the term that, that people will use, uh, will come from, they'll, they'll use the words of Paul in first Corinthians 15, uh, where it says in a in a in a flash in the twinkling of an eye, which you know our understanding of that is supposed to be really super duper fast. So their understanding of the rapture is is that okay if this is super duper fast, then when the time comes, you know, and you can you you get a sense of this when you read you know, like Tim LaHaye's novels or uh, you, know, you know the the Left Behind series or even as it's depicted in movies in in his movie or even. I've made some references, even through our study of the book of Revelation, of the 1972 movie, The Thief in the Night. You know, it has a similar understanding of the rapture where, like, you know, you have people just going about in their normal sort of thing. And then it's kind of like a now you see them, now you don't sort of thing. Um, And, you know, one moment they're there and then they just they just disappear. And that happens with millions of people all around the world. And so, you know, you have this whole thing of speculation of, you know, if you have Christians who are driving at that time, it's going to cause all sorts of accidents because, you know, they're no longer behind the wheel anymore. Airplanes are crash, you know, all that sort of thing, because they're just just kind of taken up. And again, what the way it's depicted, it's in a, it's in a very sudden manner. Again, just to use the, the thief in the night. As an example, um, in that in that movie, to you know, when it came time for the rapture, you had these different scenes of people who were just going about their normal activity, and these were these were people in, in the movie before that were characters that we understood were, were believers. One of them was a pastor, and he's you know the pastor is out on the on the front yard, uh, lawn of his of his church, you know, changing the letters on the on the marquee. And you, and then the camera shows like the, the, the sky, you know, as you know, to give the, the, 
the viewer a clue that, hey, something's about to happen here. You have another guy uh, who is, who's, you know, starting up his lawnmower. He's going to, he's going to mow the yard. Um, and then you have another guy who's, who's, you know, turn, he's shaving. He's in the bathroom. He's turning on his razor and he's shaving. Um, and then the next thing you know, in all three of those areas, all of a sudden the pastor's not there anymore. And, you know, his marquee is incomplete. Um, there's a lawnmower now from the guy that was getting ready to mow the yard. He's gone now and the lawnmower is still there running. And then you have the guy who was shaving there. He's gone and the, and the, and the razor is there, you know, you know, still on buzzing in the, uh, um, in the bathroom sink. So the, the impression that you get is that it was, it was a very quick, you know, sort of, sort of thing where people just kind of, and, and listen, nobody, a lot of people would go about really not noticing that I mean, they might notice, you know, car crashes and things like that. That wasn't depicted in the movie or anything. But, you know, it's, you know, it's very quiet. It's very secret. It's what we would call the the silent, the secret and silent rapture. Although I know that some people would kind of object to that sort of label, but I don't know how you can get around that. So, so that's really the idea. It's just kind of a, as, as you know, again, using the words of First Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye, it's just, you know, at least in the areas where where those three characters were were operating, you know, nobody's scratching. The, you know, the other people are going about as normal. They really don't notice notice that anything's going on. In other words, there's no fanfare. You know, when this when this whole thing happens. Now, and again, that's that's a belief that that has been a belief and probably still is a belief for many many people, um, on in the dispensational premillennial side, and a pre trib side. But the reason why I laid all that out is because that belief is goes directly against what you see here in verse 16, okay? So it's very important that we understand this, okay? So in verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, okay? So that seems like something like three things that are laid out there that's supposed to give us a clue that when this whole thing goes down, it's going to be noticed. It's going to be noticeable by people. But, it, you know, for people who hold to a secret and silent rapture, none of these things happen. And again, to, to use the example of how it's depicted in Thief of the Night, which I think I, I serves as an accurate representation of what a lot of people believe it's going to be like at the rapture. When you see those scene, when you see that scene, there isn't a, you know, you know, there there isn't a, a anything where the Lord descends from heaven. There isn't a cry of command. There isn't the voice of an archangel, and there isn't the sound of the trumpet of God. So it it's problematic where people's understanding of the rapture is in direct contradiction to what First Thessalonians chapter four verse sixteen actually says. And really, I think if you have a secret and silent rapture, I mean, that that helps contribute to that helps contribute to how a lot of people believe other things will unfold, you know, in the rest of the whole thing, starting with the tribulation and leading through the tribulation and then the end of the tribulation and things like that, where at the end of the tribulation, then pe- that's where that's where, where where Jesus Christ is seen and he's seen coming uh, down from heaven in the clouds. Um, but you. Uh, you know, the only other thing that you can that you can conclude if that sort of thing is true is that this is is this sort of thing something that's only going to be heard and seen from Christians. Um, I, I think it's Kim Riddlebarger in his book, and I think I've actually even heard it. And I think he's actually getting this from somebody else who he cites. I don't remember. But he's saying that really with the secret and silent rapture. And lining that up with First Thessalonians four, it's almost as if you see all those things that you know as a, as a cosmic dog whistle, you know, you know, you know the dog whistles, right? You blow it, you know, and it's really high pitched. So you know, but it, nobody, no human can hear, it, but only a dog can hear it. And so, it, you know, the question would be: Is that is that how we are to understand the rapture? You know, just given what we're seeing here, I don't think that's the idea that we have here. Now, you know, you know, because again. You have the Lord who, who who descends, and again, that the direction of everything is important here. He descends, so the fact that he's descending, and again connected to his coming, 
which again we we've all, we've already established there is one coming and I'll and I'll and I'll reinforce that and establish that with an example here from scripture here in a little bit a little, a little bit later uh but he's coming down and with his coming down there's a cry of command and which is you know this is you know that that seems appropriate given the fact that you know the dead in Christ are going to rise i think the part of that command there is him telling the people uh who are in their graves to rise from the grave um, you know, I, I, I think that in a certain sense, um, that's what you have, that's what you have going on there. But again, um, it's, it, it's a cry of command. Again, these, these words that are, that are laid out here is, it, are laid out as if this is something that's going to be heard. Okay. So it's a, it's a cry of command. Um, and then with the voice of the archangel and with the, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now there's that perspective there, but again, like I said, and maybe how, how some of you might be thinking right now, you know, there is the whole thing of First Corinthians 15, because that's that's the that's the main the verse in there that they use is the, is the main verse that is used to to justify this understanding of a secret and silent rapture, and specifically, the verse that is that is that is gone to um, is verse 51 of First Corinthians 15. And it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. There it is. Um, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and, and we shall be changed. Okay. So it talks about the dead, you know, the dead uh, rising. And again, that's something that we saw in First, in first Thessalonians 4. Um, and, you know, so the whole thing there is that, you know, in the twinkling of an eye, we read it right there. And that's actually that's actually in the in verse fifty two. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now, here's the mistake that that people make here. Well, it can't it cannot be disputed that the resurrection and the rapture happen at the same time. They they you know. And again, the way I describe it is that. The resurrection is the event, you know, you know, very much bound into the whole thing of the second coming of Christ. But the rapture is a feature within that. But the, but those two things happen at the same time. OK, it's within the same moment, within the same time period. OK, that, that all of this is going on. That's what the that's what pre-trip people would say. And that I would agree with that. That's what I would. That's what I would hold to. That's what I would believe. The problem, though, is that even though those things happen at the same time, that's not that doesn't mean that that's what we're dealing with here in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. In fact, First Corinthians fifteen speaks nothing of the rapture. The whole and take some time to read this for yourself. I mean, First Corinthians fifteen is a long chapter, and we don't have time to go over all of it. Um, but First Corinthians fifteen, the 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 subject of the entire chapter is the resurrection of the believer because what Paul was was speaking out against was was people trying to speaking and then actually I think even some Corinthians even believing um that you know that you know they're bringing up this question that the dead aren't raised there isn't going to be a resurrection and Paul is saying well wait a minute if that's the case then that means Christ hasn't risen and if Christ hasn't risen then we're all then we're all we're all dead meat OK, so again, his focus is on the resurrection and the resurrection of the body. And he even talks about, OK, well, what kind of body are we going to be raised in? Um, and that's sort of, what sort of body are we are we going to have? This whole 58 verse chapter is supposed to is supposed to center on that, on, on that whole thing. OK, so again, even though the rapture and the resurrection happens at the same time that does not mean that what we see here in 1 Corinthians 15 is in reference to the rapture because it's not from verse 1 all the way up to this point what paul is talking about is the resurrection of the believer okay and even in the verses in question here we know that this isn't the rapture how do we know because it says again i'll read it again verses 51 and 52 it says behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be raptured is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. It says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What is that? That's the resurrection, and that's the receiving of our glorified bodies, our spiritual bodies that Paul has been talking about 
this whole time within this chapter, okay, the changing is going to happen. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It is the resurrection, it's the glorification of our bodies that happens in the twinkling of an eye, not the rapture. This is very obvious, but this is something that is carried along for so many years where people say the rapture is going to be just like that. No, that because Paul is not talking about the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the resurrection, and he even says we will be changed. So what is he talking about? He's talking about what he's been talking about this whole time, how you know our bodies will go from these lowly, you know, dying bodies to one that is that is indestructible, incorruptible, that sort of thing. The resurrection of the body. That's what he's talking about. So when he's talking about we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, that's where the twinkling of an eye is applied to. It's not applied to the rapture. Okay. And it's very important to understand. So if that's true, that being true, and it is true because I mean it's very obvious there um, in the in the text there. When you go back to first Corinth, uh, excuse me, First Thessalonians four, you know we we can under you know what it says there means can mean what it says, and you don't have to contradict what Scripture says there by saying no. There's a secret and silent rapture based on First Corinthians fifteen, and you know while at the same time having to deal with this whole thing of of verse sixteen in First Thessalonians chapter four. Okay, these things are heard; they're attention getters. Okay. And, uh, you know, since the twinkling of an eye is, is, is related to the changing of our bodies at glorification, that, and that doesn't speak anything of the rapture, we can still say that verse 16 holds, for the Lord will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of, the, of an archangel and with the, with the sound of the trumpet, uh, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I, wa- I, I want to come back to the... Uh, voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God a little bit later here, but let's move on. We'll come back to those to those two things specifically, because they they speak a very powerful word, you know, as it relates to us dealing with this as one event. Okay, so in verse seventeen it says, "Then we who are alive," so again he's talked about the dead in Christ will rise first in verse sixteen. Now, what's going to happen with those who are alive? Verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we, and so we will always be with the Lord. Okay. Now, a couple of things that are, that are very important for us to, to keep in mind here. So those who are left, those who are alive and who are left, those who have not died and who are alive when, the, when Christ comes again. Uh, will be caught up together with them. Who's the them, by the way? The them is, you know, the you know those that the Lord brings with Him when He comes. Okay, and what will they do? They'll meet the Lord in the air. Now, let's talk about this whole thing about, uh, you know, will be caught up. Now, this is where this is where a lot of the lot of the debate, you know, regarding the rapture is, you know, is is kind of. That's where people kind of settle because they look at the the Greek word harpazo, um, and and usually it, it's that sort of argument is is brought forth to people who say that who say that they don't believe in the rapture, um, and so you know so people say no no it is because you know harpazo. Um, now I stand in agreement in the sense that there will be a a catching up, okay. Um, I don't, you know, there are there are some people, I would say, who who thinks who thinks that the description of the rapture is just symbolic, you know, just in the way that I said, but it's not something that you take literally. I I I don't subscribe to that. I do believe that there's going to be a literal catching up to meet the Lord in the air because the descending and the and the re- and the actual resurrection of bodies from the grave is literal. So I don't think that there's any reason to look at that as literal, but then, you know, the catching up is, you know, as not. Um, I do believe that there is a, a a catching up. Now, you know, the whole focus of the Greek word there, you know, people say, see, you know, and the, and the meaning is to be snatched away or to be snatched up or to be caught up. Um, and so, you know, and he's, a lot of people will, will rest on the whole thing of being snatched away. You know, and that's where they, and that's another reason why they'll say, okay, we're, we're snatched up and we go into heaven. But if the word can also mean to be caught up, 
you know, that doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily necessitate a snatching up all the way up into uh, uh, all the way up into heaven. Okay, we are caught up. We are snatched up. Um, I don't think it really it necessarily necessitates us being snatched away. So there is a a a catching up and remember and remember you know just from the perspective of what we're looking at here why are we why are we caught up again I think it goes back to the ancient understanding of what we have of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air and then to escort him back down by the way don't be don't be don't be bothered by that because some people will look at that and they'll say that you know why would why would the church go up only to come back down. It's kind of a sim. It w- might be a similar objection to what you might hear some people say when they ab- object to a post-tribulation rapture. And and again, that's what the understanding of of being raptured up into heaven, because their understanding is okay. You you're raptured up into heaven, and then since it's the end of the tribulation, you're just going to come back down. You know, and you know that's you have questions like that. Now, I don't believe in the post-tribulation rapture as in in that certain sense. You'll get more of an understanding of that next time when we start to talk about the tribulation. Um, but again, the, the, the similar question can be raised in people's minds. It's like, okay, why, does the, why would you say that the church goes up to meet the Lord in the air only to, be, only to come back down? Which my response is, you can, you can say that about Jesus Christ. Because if this whole thing is about us being taken up into heaven, then you'd have to ask this. We can ask the same question as it relates to Jesus Christ, because as this text says, Jesus is coming and he descends. He descends from heaven. And so he's in midair. And we are caught up to be to meet him in the air. And if we're going to heaven, then we go up into heaven. So even though our direction might be one directional from this earth all the way up to heaven, we could still ask the question of Jesus Christ. Okay, so why does Jesus come down and we meet him in the air only to for him to go back up? So he's going down and coming back up. So why does so my question would be why does that why would that make more sense? And why would that be less objectionable than if the roles were reversed and the church goes up and then comes back down? You see, somebody's going up and down or down and up in this in this scenario. It's either Jesus Christ or it's those it's those saints on earth. My contention is it's those saints on earth. They go up, they meet the Lord in the air, and then they and then they escort him down as he comes in in full and final uh, dominion and domination. Okay, and it, so that's that's really what you have there. So in um. Let's see here. So that so uh, that's it. So then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Also, keep that in the clouds in in your mind as well, and you'll see why here in a, in a few minutes. To meet the Lord in the air. Now again, meet the Lord in the air. Um, that again, notice what it doesn't. What the text doesn't say. The text doesn't say that we're caught up. In order to go all the way up into uh, all the way up into heaven, when we're caught up, the description is that we will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Why? For what purpose? To meet the Lord in the air. That's where that's where the catching up is. The, ca- the we're caught up for the purpose of meeting the Lord in the air, not to be taken to heaven. Okay, it doesn't say that we're caught up to go all the way up and ascend in, and, and ascend into heaven. Now. In fairness, somebody can say, "Well, it doesn't say that the that the that the saints descend with the Lord either," and I grant you that. But again, with the with the with the description of Jesus coming down, descending, in connection to what it says about Him, the Lord coming, and if we understand rightly and correctly that there is one coming of Christ, and you know, and also just again the testimony of other portions of Scripture which talks about Jesus's descent to earth. I think that I think that the the likely of whether of whether we're going up to heaven or we're coming down, you know, meet the Lord in the air and then we come back down with him. I think the the greater probability, just based on other portions of scripture, and even with what this is trying to communicate to the ancients, is that we meet him in the air and then we and then he comes back down. But I think it's it's very noteworthy that it says there, meet the Lord in the air. 
That's what it says about us being caught up. So I think the absence of this saying that we're caught up and the Lord will take us to heaven, and instead what it says here that we'll meet the Lord in the air, I think is I think is pretty significant there. That's the emphasis. That's the focus that 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 we have here, and it, it's going to be those who are alive, and then those who are raised, and all in within of this, all of us being changed, changed in the twinkling of an eye, and all of us, you know, both those who are raised from the dead and those who are alive, and then just given their glorified bodies, all are together with the Lord in the air, and they all together participate in this whole thing of of you know of when when Christ comes down um and descend and descends to the earth okay and so it says to meet the lord in the air and so we will always be with the lord okay now the difference between how i look at this and how you know your your basic pre pre trib um believer will look at this um is to the, the difference is the one side will say that we'll be with the Lord and, and, and that etern- and the eternity of this whole thing starts in heaven, okay? But I'm going to be one who says that this is, you know, this is, this is something that I would, I would actually argue, let's put it this way, I would actually, this is something where we would actually argue for the final consummation, the, the, the marriage, the, the actual marriage, the actual wedding of the bridegroom with his bride, the church, at the end, which as we've as we've studied at the end of the book of Revelation, we spent quite a bit of time looking at this, comes when the new heavens and new earth come into play. Okay. And so that is, you know, so we're talking about the final thing. We're talking about the about the bride in her fullness. And I think that that's important to understand as well. Because one of the contentions that I've had, and I've and I've mentioned this, I, I probably mentioned it when we were looking at chapter twenty one. I know for sure that I talked about it when we were when we were looking at chapter nineteen, the the earlier verses of of of, of Revelation chapter nineteen, is that a lot of people's understanding of the bride of Christ, and even if you're talking about the the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Quite a bit of people believe that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be something that takes place in heaven. While the tribulation is going going on down here on earth, the problem I have with that though is that during the tribulation, supposedly, we have people who come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so get, they get they get saved, and so the question would be, well, what happens with them? Do they just miss out on the marriage supper of the Lamb? Are they not part of the bride of Christ? I would say that they would, if we're just talking about being part of the bride of Christ, being that you that you put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you're brought into that into that faith community, then they're just as much of the bride as anybody else who supposedly was snatched up into heaven at the uh, at the rapture. So it, it seems to be it seems to me that we're dealing with a disjointed sort of or or unequal. You know, a, a, I guess the term that I used back then, and I guess I would I should still use now, is an incomplete bride. Okay, in Revelation nineteen, it, it anticipates that marriage supper again. Even when it talks about the marriage supper, it's not saying that text in Revelation nineteen isn't saying that the rev, that the marriage supper is happening at that moment. It just says, "Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper." That it's not saying that it's going on at that particular moment. But again. Listen, we have to we have to understand here um, that you know if 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 we're looking at it from from the pre trib view, then we're having a, a a consummation of a marriage where where the whole bride isn't even completely put together yet, and that's the contention that I, one of the contentions that I have. And listen, even let, let me back up a little bit here because again, just to just to go, you know in with you know what some people might say about the rapture again one of the one of the texts of the rapture uh regarding the rapture is um John chapter 14 uh verses verses 1 through 3 and you know again this is another place that people another passage that people will, will point to uh as it relates to the rapture not necessarily the final second coming of Christ but the rapture and so they say, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may, uh, you may be also. And so people might look at that and say, see, there, there it is, Steve. There, there is talking about the rapture because again, it's talking about the Lord who's, he's gone away to prepare a place. Um, and then, you know, it says, and then he says, I will come again and will take you to myself. Now, here's the thing that we would have to ask is the whole thing of take you to myself, does that mean that you that we are taken away up into heaven when that uh, when that when that whole thing happens? One of the things that we have to understand about this passage, I don't think Jesus is being specific about, you know, the rapture and us being taken up into heaven. In a general sense, what Jesus is talking about here is he's speaking marriage language that would have been very familiar to to ancient Jews at that time, or even not even outside of the Jewish community, ancients even outside of that community, just as far as how 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 weddings and marriages worked, because back in that time, you know the, the you know most of most of the marriages were arranged, and you had the parents of the two who would who would you know form a contract that would say that my son will marry your daughter and and, and that sort of thing. And um, and the 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 bridegroom or the family of the of the of the bridegroom would would pay a, a dowry uh, or a bride price, um, you know that 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 kind of that kind of one of the things that kind of sealed the deal of this of this contract of this of this arranged marriage. Which by the which by the way, you can maybe see the whole thing of 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 Christ shedding his blood. You know we've been purchased by his blood. You know there's that there's that whole payment there. And then what would happen is that you would have the betrothal period. Now the betrothal period was when the when the when the bridegroom uh, would go away to his father's house to prepare a place for him and his bride, uh, the, the for the woman that he that he was going to marry. Okay, um, and so hopefully you're seeing the parallels there. The, and this is this is true in the ancient in the ancient times. They would go and they would prepare and he would prepare a place. And so, when the time came for that for that wedding to, for that w- wedding that marriage to finally come together, the bridegroom would come and get the bride. And I think it was a lot of times at the bride's house that they would have a feast. And then after that feast, after, and after the ceremony, and after the, everything was was official, was I mean, it was actually technically official at the betrothal. I mean, that's how binding it was. But I mean, now you can say after the ceremony, you know, it is a done deal. And so the the man would take his wife, his his new bride, and take him and take her back to the place that he had prepared at his father's place. He was like adding an addition to the father's house and, and that sort of thing. And so that's what you have there. So do you see the parallels there? So I'm less prone to think that, you know, that we're dealing with something where this is something where... Christ is gone, and while Christ is gone, he's—I don't know if what people believe. Do they believe that there that there's places under construction in heaven or something? I don't know, but it's preparing a place. And then, when the time comes, we're snatched up, and you know we're you're, we're brought back to the Father's house, and, you know, and because he says, "I'm bringing you to myself," but bringing him to myself doesn't necess- necessitate us being brought all the way up being brought to himself is is can be seen as sort of a gathering and that's really what you have going on at the second coming of Christ is a gathering of his people together a bringing to a to, uh, bringing unto himself we're going to see this here in, in in just in just a bit but hopefully you see that this isn't so much talking about a rapture as it is as it is talking about what we've been talking about all along and that is the consummation of uh, you know of what we you know of, of the of the engagement, so to speak. Right now, we're in the betrothal period, and then when the time comes, the wedding happens at the end, when the bride and the bridegroom are are brought together, you know. And what is the place that's prepared for 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 his people? The new heavens and the new earth. Okay, and that's brought and that's brought that's constructed, and now we live with our Lord. And just to remind you, just to give you this idea of what we're dealing with here, if we're talking about weddings they were talking about marriage language as it relates to Christ and his people let me remind you again of what we see in revelation 21 and in verse 1 again it says then i saw a new heaven and a new heaven and a new earth 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, that's the people of God, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, not only do you have that, so there you have this whole thing. You get the you get the sense of this is where the bride and the bridegroom come together. Now, this is at the new heavens and the new earth after the supposed rapture, by the way. So if we're talking about a consummation of, you know, after a betrothal period, this is it. And this is what Jesus is referring to in John chapter 14. And so in verse 3 of, of Revelation 21, he goes on to say, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be there, will be with them as their God. Okay. Take you unto myself. Yeah, absolutely. And then again, as we saw, let me turn back there to first Thessalonians chapter four, um, where it says that, and, and so we will always be with the Lord. That's a, that's a, that's language of permanency there which makes sense if you're talking about the bringing together of a bride and a bridegroom, okay? And when the bride came for the bride uh, when the bride bridegroom came for the bride, that was it and they were there and they were together forever. There was a betrothal period where they weren't together. But now once the place was ready, he comes back, he and, and he comes back for his bride and once that it takes place, he is with them forever. That's what you're dealing with. So if we're talking about, so if we can acknowledge that in John chapter 14, we're dealing with a marriage, we're dealing with a, a you know wedding language that would have been familiar to the ancients, and also what Scripture says, and particularly with uh, with uh, Revelation chapter 21, as we just saw there, with the bride of Christ, us, the people of God, that's explained later in that in that passage as well coming down adorned as a bride for her bridegroom and where it says that now the dwelling place of God is with men and he will be with them and he will live with them, which again, that's that's very much marriage language, then we can look at John chapter 14 is not a rapture passage, but again, I, I, would, I, I do think it's a second coming passage, but it's not a rapture passage where it says, okay, once the place is prepared, we're raptured up into heaven. I don't think that's I, I don't think that's what Jesus is 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 getting at there, um, is the idea there. So to nail this down, and I said I'd go back to um, verse sixteen where it talks about uh, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Let me uh, let me turn your attention back to well, not back to because I don't think we looked at this originally, but in Matthew chapter twenty four. This portion of the Olivet Discourse, and again, just as a reminder, uh, to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End, which talks about this very discourse here. But in Matthew chapter 24, notice Jesus' words here when it's talking about the second coming of Christ. And this is something that dispensational, pre-trib, premillennial people will identify. No, this isn't the rapture. This is the second coming of Christ. Notice what it says here. Now I'm going to contend that the rapture and the second coming are 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 two are, are two like they're they're simultaneous. This it's referring to the same thing here. But notice what Jesus says. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see, notice, uh, underline that term, see, they, you know, so not only is this something that's going to be heard, as we saw in First Thessalonians 4, but it's going to, something that's going to be seen in chapter 24. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you think this is something that people are going to miss? No. And, the, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, uh, with a loud uh, tr- with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather, gather his elect right from the four winds. So, in other words, from every from every part of the globe, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, again, I think that that's very much uh, uh, rapture language. 
it doesn't say caught up, but it says gather. I mean, that that's what we're, it's going to happen when we're caught up. We're going to be gathered and we're going to be brought together and then we're going to be gathered at the, at the, at the, at the judgment seat of Christ or for the, for those who are unbelievers, it's going to be the great white throne judgment that we see at the end of Revelation chapter 20. Um, or the sheep and the goats, as we see here in, in, in Matthew 20, uh, in Matthew 25. Okay, but again, like I said in First Thessalonians four, I was going to bring you back to bring your attention back to the whole thing of the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet. And the reason why I bring that up, let's consider there with the voice of the of an archangel. Now, why would the voice of the archangel be a thing? You know, what is the voice saying? Is it giving a command of some sort? I think that that he might be he, you know, perhaps it very much is giving a command to who to God. No, that's not how that works. You know, to to those who are raised from their graves. No, I think that's what the command of God is is all about. His command, God's command, is what is what raises people out of their graves. So, what's the voice of the archangel? If remember, if you think of the archangel as a chief angel, and that's really what it means to be the archangel. Arch, coming from the Greek word arche, which you know can kind of mean chief of or or leader of. This is an archangel who, who with the with the voice of the archangel, is it possible that his from his voice is unleashed what we see here in Matthew 24, where it says, and he will send out his angels, you know. Now he, Christ, will also send out his angels, and I and it, you could say is through the archangel who who himself sends out sends out all the other angels. Um you know, that could very well be a possibility. But the, the point here is that angels are involved here, okay? But probably even more important than that is the whole thing of the trumpet. Now, again, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, it says that um, um, with the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet, what do we see here in, in, uh, in, verse, uh, uh, in verse 31 of Matthew 24? And they will gather his, uh, excuse me, um, in verse 31, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Okay. And by the way, just so we don't, that we don't miss this either in the, in the prior verse, in verse 30, it says that they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. And first Thessalonians four, we see Jesus descending from heaven and we meet him in the clouds there in in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verse 17. But again, back to the whole trumpet thing. We see the trumpet uh, trumpet call of God in in 1 Thessalonians 4, and we see the trumpet here in um, in, uh, in Matthew Matthew 24 uh, and in verse 31. And now here's particularly where this is super duper duper important. I'm going to bring to your mind again 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And um, the the verse that is usually um, that is usually used to to talk about the rapture and it being very a very quick secret and silent sort of thing in the twinkling of an eye. So we so there's an acknowledgement from the pre trip side that this is talking about the rapture. Now I, again, like I say, I don't think this is talking about the rapture. It's talking about the resurrection of our bodies. That's what's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. But again, the resurrection and the rapture happen simultaneously. Now. If this is what the other side refers to as the as the rapture, notice what it says here. Uh, again, verse fifty-one: "Behold, I tell you a mystery: we shall not all we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be in, and we shall be changed." But notice there at the last trumpet. Now, here's the question. If the rapture and the second coming are two different events, and what people acknowledge here in 1 Corinthians 15 is referring to the rapture, the rapture supposedly will happen at the last trumpet. And then seven years later will come the second coming of Christ. But at the second coming of Christ, this comes with a loud trumpet call. But as we just saw in 1 Corinthians 15, this is at the last trumpet. So if, if the trumpet at the rapture is the last trumpet, then why do we have another trumpet here in this distinct event in Matthew 24? See what I'm saying there? 
This is another big clue to me that would that would seem to indicate that what we're dealing with is one single event. The rapture slash second coming are not two separate events. They're one event. And so that goes back to what I was saying before as far as how we look at the rapture and how we look at the second coming or the second coming and the resurrection and everything. The second coming and our resurrection, you know, of our, and glorification of our bodies and everything is the event. That's what we're looking forward to. The rapture is just a feature within the event. Okay. And what we see here, the resurrection, and again, people will acknowledge, people on the other, on the other side will acknowledge this is talking about the rapture. So I'm just saying, okay, if that's what we're saying here, if, the, if we're saying that this is the rapture, then we have to acknowledge that what it says here is that this is at the last trumpet. So if this is at the last trumpet, then why do we see the trumpet call? In the, in the supposedly separate event of the second coming in Matthew 24. That's problematic, I mean, to the, to the pre-trib understanding of this. From my perspective, it's not a problem at all because, as I've said, this is all one event. This is all happening at the same time. One resurrection, one coming, one last trumpet, Okay. And again, so again, if we understand what, what the concern of the Thessalonians were, we get the, we get the impression, and even how Paul lays things out, we get the impression, we get the understanding that what we're dealing with is, is, is one event because their concern is one event. At this one event, what is going to become of our dead loved ones if they're dead at the, by the time, at the time that this comes? And again, you might even have some people say, if we die before that time, do we lose out? And Paul says, no, you're not going to miss out on that event. And so he goes in to describe that event. And then part of the feature of that event is the catching up, the rapture that happens there. But again, Jesus comes down. He descends from heaven at his coming. The Lord is coming. You know, again, you use the words there in First Thessalonians chapter 4. And again, with the fact that we were that we will be with him forever. Again, I think that that again points to the permanency of things, as you know, just as it relates to the bridegroom finally coming for his bride, and with his bride, I guess you could say as well. Um, and then everything being consummated, that being lined up with what we saw in Revelation chapter twenty-one. Okay, and so that's what we're de- what we're dealing with, and it's in that way. As we go back to verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So this is something that's supposed to encourage us. And isn't that encouraging? Listen, even with the perspective that I have, if you disagree with it, 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 it you know, you have to admit that it's not necessarily, you know, cataloging anything that takes away from anything. In fact, it accelerates, I think, you know, what, you know, what people are looking forward to. Because again, if you look at, you know, the hope of what Paul talks about and everything like that, again, I'll, I'll take you back, uh, I'll take your attention back to Romans chapter eight, when he's talking about the redemption of our bodies. And even following from that is talking about the the recreation of the creation that's now groaning in anticipation for that, for that newness. He says in Romans eight, in this hope, we were saved. Okay. That's the recreation the new heavens and the new earth, resurrection life, the redemption of our bodies, that is where our eye is at, which happens at the singular second coming of Christ, not the rapture. The rapture is just a feature. Now, I think the rapture is going to be cool. I think it's going to be cool to, to, to be caught up and to meet the Lord in the air. Again, I don't want to you know, throw shade on that or, or, or kind of make it insignificant. I, I hope I haven't done it. it. That is a significant thing. But again, it is just a feature within the entire within the within the entire event of the second coming. So hopefully, and let's use that. Isn't that encouraging? If it is, and you're convinced of that, encourage one another. And again, given the Thessalonians and their concerns and what they were wanting Paul to answer here, this would have been a great encouragement. He says, you can encourage one another with these words. And listen, the same is true for us today. And I think it's a shame that we, we spend more time arguing about, about these things um, than encouraging one another. Now, I think that there is some encouraging going on. But again, like I said, for a lot of people, this is a hair, hair trigger topic um, where people end up being in bitter fights and conflict over things like that. And in some cases, in some extreme cases, even dividing over things like this. 
Why are we dividing over things where, uh, over things that we should be encouraging one another over? And we can still talk and debate about those things. Those things aren't bad. It's not wrong. But at the end of the day, remember what we said a couple of weeks ago, we still end up at the same finish line. And that's what we're ultimately looking towards. And so we can still even there encourage one another with that, even though we, you know, we're still trying to work out between one another, what does scripture really say? How should we understand this? How should we understand that? And that sort of thing. But hopefully all of this is making sense now. So hopefully you can see the unity of everything related to the rapture, the resurrection, the coming of Christ, all of those things, the trumpet, the you know, the last trumpet and everything like that. Um, and hopefully I've done an adequate job of putting all those pieces together and just you know, just as we picked apart that passage um, in first Thessalonians chapter four. So I hope that it's that, that it's uh, that it's understandable to you. Now, for a fuller discussion on the singular event, because you know there's other things that you can say in other places that you can look at um, related to all of that and how to how to understand that and again, how to understand that um, as it relates to the Olivet discourse. Pick up a copy of my book, Signs of the End, because I go into uh, I go into greater discussion um, and uh, in more detail about how that works, um, and you know, laying out some scriptural evidences and how we should look at these things, and looking at the wording, and paying attention to the wording as well, and and and, and that sort of thing. So, if if this is wet your appetite for more of that sort of thing, I would encourage you to to pick up a copy of my book because I, I I go into more detail. Um, as it relates to that, so, uh, as that sort of thing here. So the book is Signs of the End. What did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? Amazon.com, BarnesNoble.com are the two main places that you can get that. Um, and again, it's a it's it's an examination of Jesus' words to his disciples on the Olivet Discourse. Okay, so. As far as everything else, we will leave the rapture there. And what we're going to do next time is we're going to go into the tribulation because, you know, when you talk about the rapture, usually the tribulation, the talk about the tribulation is attached to it because, again, you you think rapture, you think, okay, pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. Now, given what I've described about the rapture and because of our tendency to think of the rapture in connection to the tribulation as far as when is the rapture going to happen in light of that, Given everything that I've just described now, that might leave questions in your mind. It's like, okay, so what about the tribulation? Are you saying that the church is going to be here when the seven-year tribulation is going to is going to take place? We will get into that. We will talk about that. Now, I will say this, um, you know, because because people will say, okay, you're so basically you're you're post-trib. I I don't I don't I I'm I'm. Technically, you could say yes, but I'm not post-trib in the traditional sense that people that people understand post-trib. And you understand what I mean by that when we start to talk about the tribulation next time. It's not it's not it's not in the same way that a lot of other people understand it. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the the standard understanding of of post-tribulationism. Okay, so um, if that gives you a little bit of an idea, but like I said, we'll go we'll go into a little bit more detail. We'll discuss it. Um, starting next time. Okay. And uh, it should be an interesting examination. So we will leave it there. If you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio's YouTube or Spotify. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. Um, also, my other account on Twitter at LT Scripts Pod. That's L T S E R I P T S P O. O-D. All right, uh, friends, had a great time uh, examining uh, all of this and explaining all of this. And hopefully you're uh, you're enjoying this as well. And hopefully it's profitable and instructive for you. And, and again, like I said, take what we're, we're, we're discussing here and continue to delve into scripture. Look into it yourself. Do your own examination. OK, um, check out. Check me out to, to check out what I've been talking about and, and line it up with scripture and ask, is this is this true? Does this truly line up with the biblical text? Um, now, there might be certain again, certain questions that you might have, you know, again, a lot of it having to do with the tribulation. But as I said, we'll go ahead and talk about that starting next time. OK, so again, uh, good things in store as we get into that. But for now, we'll leave it there. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now.